this translating R code is really nice because it starts with, we are going to use all meta, all that meta programming into doing some translating R code into SQL, into HTML and finally latex. But there is a little thing at the very beginning. It says the first paragraph, if you want to know more about domain specific languages, go read this book by Fowler. I'm like, okay. Let's, let's do it. It's funny, why does it mean? So Fowler wrote a book, Domain Specific Languages. He talks about these things in which we have a language that we use, we base in a semantic model and we use that language to answer one very specific question. It's most likely a subset of the language we're working on or another one. It's not supposed to be comprehensive. It's just one task. It is to read and write if it did to those to do not code, but he, and he talks specifically a business analyst. So I guess that if you show the thing in, in a domain language, those was in the DSL to business analysts, they will get it. If you say to developers, they'll get it. If you say to domain experts, they will be able to get it as well. So, and furthermore, the last one is fluent. Uh, Fowler goes about in the book later on how you assign one, one sentence, one instruction leads into the other, leads into the other, pretty much as when you're working with pipes you and Dippler. You make a request that leads into the next one, that leads into the next one. But he's also very vague. And so I'll explain later, he never does. So if you guys want to read the book, uh, it's your local library, your Amazon. It has advantages and benefits, it's easy to maintain. You base it on the domain model, people can read it, you don't lose generalization. And again, it's a translation from business case to code. Because, and I'm going to mention a couple of things. The grammar of graphics, this DSL implementation, when you read the first things about the grammar of graphics, it's an impressive book about how to do visualization. It has a high, highly conceptual approach to that. So there was this guy in 2011, Wickham wrote about this thing. Well, not in 2011. The Google talks about 2011. This is later on. And he says that it's table, ggplot, tipler, tipler, they are DSLs. So, and if you have the ability to get your hands on the grammar of graphics, just so you can see what it is behind, what the cons concepts behind ggplot are, is interesting. It's also dense and complicated to obtain that book. So after all that DSL is basically we abstract, we do a little language has advantages, has disadvantages, is not Turing complete, we can modify, change it, move it here and there. And then we solve the one specific a narrow implementation of something we need. Uh, Fowler work talks about doing some controls in, in some devices. We can talk about ggplot or Dippler. Okay, so let's now to SQL. SQL gets like a paragraph over here, but I was looking a little bit more into how to do the TD, one diverse example of the SQL, um, how it works. So I got this example from Data Carpentry and I download the whole thing and run it on my computer. It is boring because it's not anything that you need to do. But the advantage is that if you are doing data analysis in deep in R and using Deepler, you just you can write the code as it shows here, select year, species ID, etc. Or you can do pipes. This is the survey, the, the database mammals, the table surveys, and the surveys gives you that and it goes down the page because it never happens but you notice over here it has it has this double integrant symbol because when i ask for the head give me n equals five it gives me the data again it doesn't know how much it is so when i ask for the number of rows in the database it doesn't know again dsl is a subset of the original language it has specific implementation, is not complete. It's, it's, it doesn't have all you need. It's just what is convenient. 
So that's why I included this one here. This would have come so handy on a previous implementation that was millions of rows and coding it into R, base R was uh, painful. Yeah, how did you handle that? I bought, I, I rented an Amazon machine, the biggest I could handle. I put everything into memory, uh, let it run for a couple hours, actually like 12 hours and get subsets and sample the data as much as I could to get an idea of what it was. It had results, but everything, everything, every time something failed, it was a disaster. And because it was such a big corpus, it meant that every, every little, um, every so often, there will be errors in the data. There will be coding. It was not UTF, but uh, whatever, ASC, I, I. And that would crash the whole thing. So I had to go and make sure that it didn't crash that often at least. And eventually it gave me what I wanted. I, I got generalizable conclusions. I presented them at the end. So it's good, but yeah. Nowadays, it will be easier. With this thing, it will be way easier. And I just do a random sample of the whole thing. Also, there are other tools like disk frame in which it reads from the disk. Problem is it will kill your disk because you have to read so many times. So, okay. So uh, uh, speak of the SQL translation, you do the, the, the normal pipes, surveys, filters, select, and we ask it to show the query. SQL, select ID, da, da, da. It doesn't have to be perfect SQL. It sends it to the database, the database gets it, and you get the result, whatever it is. And we get lazy evaluation. It only gets evaluated at the last moment when we said collect, please. And then it creates this object. So it's filtered and you can view it normally. And I didn't put it here because it's super long. I should have, but I didn't. Okay. That is it about the SQL. It's again, it's an SDL, it's a small, we don't care about it. We don't care about the completeness. SQL with um, with the procedures is Turing complete. This little thing is never Turing complete. Same here with HTML. HTML with CSS is Turing complete, but this what we're going to see is just a normal view to generate core HTML from R. And we all read the book. We all read the chapter, so we all know what is this. I also watched the videos, and one thing that struck me is that I'd rather do it in inverse way. So nesting or name arguments become content, name arguments become attributes, special characters are escaped. So this is what we want. With HTML, we want a code. If a, then we use that code to evaluate it and we have whatever we need. So going in reverse, we go HTML tags and we do this. HTML tags, we're going to have both tags that are the hat content and the void tags that do not have content. So let's continue. This is the map, you remember, this is all the tags with content. Uh, when you're going with HTML, the content means that they will have children, uh, not children, so the title, subtitle, and so on. The head, it has content and it will have a content in the middle. Have the body will have all what we see, things like that. And the ones that are void, for example, the most famous one is image. We just tell image, the alt, the title, the link, and that's it. We close it. They are. So here we create a tags that have content. We create a function. And that's why I went backwards because it made sense coming, going through the maze in reverse. We know where we want to be. We know what we're doing. We're just moving forward in a way that we can see where we're doing all the stuff that we're doing. So we define the tags. Now we have the tags are 
that define what we're going to do. Also, we since we're going to use this in functions, we want to avoid collisions with the base R namespace. They're going to be restricted to the function, so we don't have to worry about it. Function tag, new function, the expression, then we use the those partitions at the L images. The those partition is that the one that used um, the list two, the list two in order to give many arguments that we see it later. And we map the whole thing. These are going to have children. That's where the tags, and then we call the environment in which it happens. Same thing for void tags, but the void tags do not need to have uh, children. So we just, and we have to name the arguments. HTML attributes, dots named, paste zero tag, uh, and we call the environment again. The helper function that he mentioned is this list tool in which we can get any attributes over here that we need. If we don't have anything, dots. If we have something, it's dots, it's not, it's not. This is the one that he casually briefly says trivial as an exercise for the reader. HTML attributes, uh, and literally he says that. He uh, goes through the attributes making sure that they are correct and zero, there are nothing, one, must be null or length one, and that's it. I have an end notes later on for this one. I have reference for this. So we now end at the beginning. We escape the characters that we want, less than, larger than, and ampersand. If the character is part of HTML, we don't escape it. Okay, and I didn't put up, and I didn't, of course, why would I write an example? Um, it makes sense to me to start with a goal in mind because we're going to be building on that, but at the same time, going from the from the last one forward, because for the last one, because we start we at the beginning it is not clear what he's saying. We're going to escape. Yeah, we're going to escape because we don't we have many things that are symbols used in R. We want to escape in, and then we want to use the attributes function to make sure that the attributes and the helper function to see that we can receive all the stuff. We have the tags, the no content and the content, and then we map them, and we have the type that we need. And I should have included an example. Again, this is a very easy, convenient way in which we can just simply type code by using the normal functions. We don't leave the space, the R space. We add these things, and as with any model that and any DSL, we can always add more functionality to that. We can always add more things in case we want to make it more complicated. Not much. Okay. In translating to LaTeX, I didn't go back and back backwards. I just went forward. I didn't care. <laughs> haven't used LaTeX that much, so I was not going to reinvent here things. I just went directly with what they said. We're going to make similar things to what we did in HTML, in the H2 HTML, but in here we got to make sure that they are evolution environment. We don't have that always constant. And we have, we never evaluated an argument environment, okay. And we want to be perfect and how to. So the same thing here, we define the symbols and Greek env as a part of the environment, because we want the environment. And for unknown symbols, we map them and put them there because we don't know exactly what we're going to have all of these. And we create the environment. Latest environment is going to include the symbol environment and all this. Symbol environment is going to be a parent of Greek environment. We have all of them together. For non functions, we are the unary binary operators where we have 
A plus B, for example, or the ones in which we just have some binary operators, unary operators in which we don't do anything else. Okay. And now we all define these, the binary operators, and we put them into the F environment. All the man functions, square root, sin, log, ups, fraction. Then we create a latex environment to which we add F names, simple environment, and the Greek environment. We call the unknown functions. And we have as well the map. And we do the function that we're going to evaluate, the closure for the function unknown. That's it. We update the latest environment because that's what we're doing. We include all the previous environments. So we have names, symbols, Greek, and all the calls. Hmm. That was fast. Okay. Um, the HTML attributes function, the Google talk about what he's talking about, visualization DSL, grammar, graphics, and domain specific languages references, and the example for the SQL. I didn't do the exercises because some of those are. Tricky. And while I consider the DSL discussion amazing and really interesting, I don't feel that confident on going into that with solving those, those exercises. Anybody else? Anybody did the exercises? I don't remember. I think I did a couple of them. Okay, and that was this chapter. This chapter was too, too small, and it has the two examples, and that's what I was um, just going through. DSL and some examples of the of this particular situation because it makes sense to go into the why. You make uh, why are we doing meta programming because it gives us access to a tool and makes R into a tool to increase production. Literally, DSL is one of the benefits is that DSL's increased production makes things easy for everybody. That's a 